Good afternoon. Thanks a lot, Stephen, for the introduction. Uh, I want to thank Atlas Society for this kind invitation. I think it's especially very important nowadays that we are seeing so many books that have been published studying the roots of what authors consider to be clear examples of the history of capitalism. And I think that what you'll hear in the next two sessions will be uh, maybe uh, something you will not agree, and I hope to have some of your answers and questions in the Q&A session. I think that it's hard to start talking about capitalism without grasping how these principles have been so damaged by the, by the initial creators of the term. And to talk about the topic of capitalism and trying to link it with global, with global history will require for us to ring a lot of coffee machines. So I'm not planning to do so this time. I will try to stick just to uh, proving that capitalism is, is what capi I'm not going to, to try to prove what capitalism is. I think Ayn Rand already did it pretty well. Her job was fantastic developing that. And I just will try to stick and explain how this, the, this, it, this is the only moral social per, uh, system that we have. Uh, I will try to demonstrate what is capitalism and I will indicate its proof by taking examples from history in regard to the existence or non-existence of many of the principles that have been characterizing it and that have been so damaged by the authors that created it and then by new schools of study, especially in history, that have completely destroyed. So please be warned from this moment on that an entire and consist understanding of the history of capitalism is not going to be provided by me and I think that wouldn't be able of doing it, will be, it wouldn't be able of getting by anyone else. So it's very good that we will have lots of extra time to discuss any particular historical moment that you would like to talk about because we're a very privileged group. Most of you already know what capitalism stands for, what are its principles, and how Ayn Rand managed to justify it wonderfully as no one else in history had done it before. I think, take for granted today as well that you are an objectivist educated audience. And I take the premises of capitalism as axiomatic to you. If this is not so, I please really recommend you to study Ms. Rand's philosophical works and to study the works that many other authors have done to explain the introduction of objectivism. And maybe this will help you when I start explaining how I think that uh, capitalism has never existed as a social system. And as such, to hear many authors that have linked it to clear examples in history with us, you could try to explain, oh, capitalism existed and it's a system that uh, the founding fathers created and we had it maybe for a couple months and you'll hear others who will say, no, no, capitalism lasted until the constitution was finally drafted. Or others will say, no, it lasted until 1820s. Or many others later will say, no, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln destroyed it, but before? We had a fully capitalist system in which it was full of entrepreneurs and all of them were moral. I really disagree with that point. And if anyone here would like to contradict it, I'd be very happy to, to hear your points. <coughs> to conclude this introduction, my goal after the lectures, today and tomorrow, so I hope that I'll see the same amount of people or more tomorrow, <laughs> will be that you will learn new insights on what capitalism stands for, and that you will be able of identifying its principles in historical examples. Lastly, my third goal will be for you to also learn how to reject the ideas of many scholars that have defended capitalism without recognizing its moral justification. And this is what makes objectivism important and valuable. There are many other schools that are very friendly to liberty, but that have failed to understand how the morality of capitalism can only be justified on the defense that Ayn Rand did of individual rights as the basic constituting unit of society. And I think this last point is the most important and difficult thing to achieve for us. I was very lucky that I grew up in a family in which capitalism was understood with the definition that Ayn Rand gave. And it, I, I cannot say that I grew up socialist, yes. Guatemala was a very social democrat country when I was born in the 80s. And, but maybe there's many other people who never had that luck of having been born and taught in objectivist ethics. So I wish you a wonderful summer seminar and I hope that I'll see you soon 
in the next couple of years. I define capitalism with the same definition given by Ms. Rand of a social system based on the recognition of individual rights, including property rights, in which all, private, in which all property is privately owned. And her best exposition, in my opinion, of this term and of how she developed it, you will, I'm pretty sure that you all, you all read it, it's in the, her essay, What is Capitalism? This essay is very special. Because when you first are starting, she opens very differently from the rest of the essays that she had written. In many of her essays, she begins with a clear introduction of what is she going to talk about and explains it. But in this specific essay, Ms. Runs opened it with a very interesting observation on how the scientific fields and humanistic fields are in a state of degener degeneration. This is important to mention because it was the field of history the clearest product, in my opinion, on how this degenerated system was created and it continued growing. Why? Because the first chairs of history were founded two decades after the famous proclamation of year one in, 19, in 1792. There was an opening for a history chair first in the University of Berlin, only 100 miles north from where I'm living, in 1810. And in 1812, the second one was founded at Napoleon Sorbonne. By the second quarter of the 19th century, history had already become formally constituted as a discipline, and it had its own elaborate array of professional journals and theoreticians. As was aimed by the creators of this new measurement, after the French Revolution of time and the creation of new disciplines, the study of history was also born with an understanding of the ideas and events behind the revolutionary ideas of 1776 and 1789, to be figured as embedded in historical moments that had not direct uh, relation to, he, to, to, the, to the present. There was no co consistency on causality nor any understanding at the beginning on these effects. They were considered just as maybe the Greeks understood myths. And the long-term effects of this historical way of historicizing can still be found today whenever you hear people talking about how the founding fathers uh, had this wonderful utopian ideas that we can go back and link to them but that at the same time cannot explain how we ended up in this problem. You see, you, you hear them as references on libertarianism, on liberty, history, about how they were these completely secular men but still there's no clear separation between church and state in, in the US government, which is the only system that was created with many of the principles of capitalism that Ayn Rand then later co continued to study. And thus history tended to be studied as to be only historical precedents and models that had no re direct relation to humanity. In the same way, these principles behind historicism affected the way in which the history of the term capitalism was understood and of how capitalism was later applied to explain social systems in different places of the world. For example, the use of the term capitalism and the role of capitalists since its conception appear as a mean to describe an economic and social precedent, a model that was to be overcome and improved by the coming of better systems. This was justified by many economic misinterpretations on how human action takes places. And you can listen to some of these historical arguments still today. Capitalism was in its birth understood as a consequence of evil and never its premises were studied or clearly defined by those who conceptualized the term. By the end of the 19th century, this historical approach to the history that was articulated by historicist schools and further advanced by the works of Hegel, Hegel Marx, Foucault, Dewey, then Kuhn, and many other philosophers of science, to mention just some names, continue extending into a multidisciplinary and macroscale approach to world history and to social systems that aim to, des to describe the world history and social change as a fluctuating machine that was going to be at going from one level to the other and in which there was going to be a continuous class struggle that later extended to uh, to talk about a struggle between races and gender etc cetera, etc cetera. as you all know the word capitalism was going on until the 19th century and it came from someone who was very critical of the concept. Added to this, it was during the same time 
that many of the ideas and abstractions that we now understood of how capitalism is formed were only a product that was being criticized by the same people who started using the terms or who pulled them from history, from the times of Smith or what Ricardo had to say only 50, 60 years before. Many texts define economics as the study and of the allocation of the scarce resources. That has been the very consistent way in which ha we have heard it and studied it. And in, in the, that's the way in which many of the politicians and economists nowadays talk in the media. It was to be economics was the study of how a society took the wealth that had that had been produced and how is it distributed efficiently. Others will talk about utility. Others will refer to how economic wealth is well, not well distributed and has to be redistributed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And how was production going to be allocated among different purposes? Academics understood the history of capitalism as the study on how the scarce resources started to be allocated in society and distributed in the past, and of how disastrous and inhuman this allocation worked, was always been done by referencing capitalism next to its supposed inefficiencies. Capital, land, and labor were the central terms. And the questions that were raised were centered in the problem of the allocation of the surplus. Ms. Rand said that this was an actual problem, and this study of economics and capitalism assumed many things that may be wrong and not true. She thus started to ask fundamental questions in order to start an educated discussion in history economics and politics, not from the middle of a story, as had been done previously by many, many, even by historians and economists, but from the very beginning of how the term came to be. To understand what Ms. Rand try, uh, tried to do, or actually she did, and achieved very well, I will exemplify, exemplify it as if we were, were going to read a book on the history of the United States of America for the first time, never before we heard about it, and as if we were going to aim, learning how the country came to be and was founded. Why? By whom? For what purposes and by which means? Without paying attention or knowing which were the previous historicals and the global events that enabled it. So can you imagine if it will be possible to understand the correct and true reasons and principles behind the foundation of the country? without having a clear idea of what was going on before these territories, I think it will be very hard. And it's something, it's still something that you see when people write books about uh, the third world and how it came to be without having a clear understanding of post-colonialism and all this agency that was done there and the struggles of power or on how the same initial tribes that existed there were also having autocratic systems that were just transplanted, transplanted, sorry. Can you imagine reading the Declaration of Independence of the United States without having no knowledge of what happened before its draft during the weeks after June 11 in, 19, in 1776? With the participation of Ben Franklin, with Thomas Jefferson, uh, with Robert Livingston, which is someone we don't, we don't hear in the mainstream, and with Roy, or Roger Sherman in Connecticut. Can you imagine reading the Declaration of Independence without understanding what were the principles behind these words? Ayn Rand was actually the first one who decided to do something like this when approaching capitalism because no one before had tried to do so. They gave, it, they gave for granted what Karl Marx and many other uh, economists previous to him referred to the term capitalist. Since I cannot do so, and I think that you couldn't also try to understand the history of the US without paying attention to the history before, I think that we are now getting closer to what happened with the term capitalism. Generally, the current historical narrative points out that capitalism is an economic system that became dominant in the Western world following the demise of feudalism. Now, you are, there are many historians who will argue that capitalism not necessarily began after the demise of feudalism. And there are many others who will argue that the term feudalism, as is wrongly misunderstood as capitalism is nowadays. And as you know, more historians do not even have a consensus on the precise definition of what the term capitalism stand. And the consensus is, not in six, is non-existent because many of, uh, many of the principles that constitute this term 
uh, were never studied from a consistent epistemology, from a consistent metaphysics, and from a consistent politics or ethics that was able to be grouped together. This is on, something that only objectivism has achieved. And I think that that's the reason why we're all here. Capitalism was considered to be con component of these specific principles. Private ownership of the means of production, the creation of goods and services for the profit of income, the accumulation of capital, competitive markets, voluntary exchange and wage labor. This is the way capitalism is studied and understood in many economics books and in history books and the relations between the participants in all these uh, activities are the ones that usually all humanities are trying to discuss, argue against and destroy. Added to these principles, historians apply them to understand a variety of historical cases and try to contextualize them in time, geography, politics and culture, and to link them to global scales that will be able to reproduce in different areas. In their aim of understanding and explaining capitalism, many people from goodwill, economists especially, usually emphasize the degree to which government did not control over markets and property rights. People like to talk about the limited state uh, without understanding what, like limited government, government, sorry, without trying to grasp it on the, what is, what is it good about it? What's moral about this? And even the author of the term never had an interest on a limited government. He wanted just a, the largest government of all, which is the government of the peoples, for the peoples. To them, the extent to which markets are free, aka capitalistic, is a result of the rules that define property and the policy of a territory. As a result, it is in the fields, especially of capitalism, that I'm pretty sure that you have read terms like chronic capitalism, corporate capitalism, mercantilist capitalism, privileged capitalism, oligarchical capitalism, social capitalism, mixed capitalism, anarchic capitalism, democratic capitalism, libertarian capitalism, autocratic capitalism, totalitarian capitalism, dictatorial capitalism, evil capitalism, rapacious capitalism, and dozens of more anti-concepts that are daily used in papers and articles, in news reports everywhere. Just in the last couple of months reading lots of essays uh, and papers for, for, my, for my degree, I've read all these words. And I think all of you already knew them, right? So <laughs> this exemplifies wonderfully how the fallacy of the stolen concept has been applied and multiplied like prostitute-like everywhere in, in, in writings and papers of the most re renowned academics everywhere. There is not single academic who will respect himself that's something I heard just last week. There's not a single academic, even a classical liberal, who will dare to try to quote Ayn Rand as a reference for the works. But maybe these same persons will be talking about chronic capitalism and using an anti capitalism that has no objectivity at all. And they will think it's okay, that's the way it should work. It's okay to talk about chronic capitalism, capitalism in order to defend capitalism without they are acknowledging that they are just doing a package deal in there that is actually destroying the foundation of the principle as something moral. <laughs> well, this term, the capitalist term, which as the basic unit of capitalism, was created to, as a reference to the owners of capital and not as the meaning of someone adhering to the economic definition of a capitalist system. And the term capitalist dates back to the mid 17th century and it's derived from the Latin word capitale. Capitale is also a derivation from another term called caput, which means head. And it's also the origin of the word chattel or cattle in the sense of the movable property that we will nowadays call livestock. The word capitale emerged in the 12th and 13th centuries in the sense of referring to funds, stocks of merchandise, sums of money, or money carrying interests. By the end of the 13th century, this term was also used in the sense of the capital assets of a trading firm and it was frequently interchanged with a, no, with a different number of words like wealth, money, funds, goods, property and so on and so forth. This was also a very important time of expansion of commerce. Three centuries later, by 1633 and 1653, the Hollandish Mercurius used this term capitalist to refer to owners of capital. And in 1788, 
The term capitalist was used by the French Hellenist and magistrate Etienne Clavier to refer again to those who own capital. So we had already established by the end of the 18th century a very clear consensus of what capitalist mean. David Ricard also referenced the term capitalist in his book Principles of Political Economy and Taxation in many occasions already by 1817. And even a poet, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, wrote about capitalists in his opinions regarding philosophy, economics, society, and religion. It's very interesting how he refers uh, from a very Christian perspective uh, the, to the term capitalism. The term slowly became widely used by authors and by the 1840s it was already widely used and condemned, of course, because capitalists are evil. That's the way it worked. Proudhon, using his first book, the title, title What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government, uh, a depiction of, that was going to be used for the next 150 years, and it became very quickly the norm. Capitalists were deemed as exploitative. They were men who profit from the labor uh, of the laborers and paid back the small salaries and robbed them. They were already considered evil men, and he extensively referenced them by linking them to Phaedrus' lion fable. I don't know if you know the fable, he, there's a, the translation I got says, I am the contractor, I take the first share. I am the laborer, I take the second. I am the capitalist, I take the third. I am the proprietor, I take the whole. And these four men are considered to be the, the, the root of capitalism. Even if we talk about an entrepreneur, it's only a couple of us who understand that the role of the entrepreneur is to produce more and do many other things out of innovation. But these four different uh, names for the same person that we consider an entrepreneur are considered to be the, the solely individuals who take absolute, absolute control of society. Further references to capitalist exploitation are referenced in, in Proudhon's book. Since he seemed to be very worried that the laborer's means of production, which was their workforce, had been to completely taken and stolen by the contractors, who were capitalists and proprietors. His conclusion was that, quote, the interest of the capitalist, in other words, the increase of the either tense on account of the power of the labor, the multiplication of the products and exchanges to continually diminish and by constant reduction to disappear. So that in a society proposed by Louis Auguste Blanqui, so I think you all know him, he was a very, very famous French socialist, equality will not be a realized at first, but would exist potentially. Since property, though outwardly seeming to be industrial feudality, being no longer a principle of exclusion or encroachment, but only a privilege of division, would not be slow. Sorry thanks to the intellectual and political emancipation that will be achieved by the proletariat, in passing into absolute equality, as absolute as anything can be on this earth." Close quote. This is the system that was from which, cap this is the term, the capitalist, from which capitalism is rooted. And it's the way in which many people is, are still trying to explain history. As you see this definition of what a capitalist is, how he produces, how he produces and what he does to society has not changed much since the 1840s. And this condemnation of self-interest and profit in Western societies has been as old as the words of, the, of Jesus Christ, who said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the world but loses his soul? Only eight years after Proudhon's book was published in 1840, Karl Marx and Engels used the term capitalist in their communist manifesto to, the, to refer to the private owner of capital who, quote, organized crowded masses of laborers in their factories and made them slave, slaves of a bourgeois class and of a bourgeois state, and who also were daily and hourly enslaved by machines, by the overlooker, and above all, by the individual bourgeois, bourgeois manufacturer himself, close quote. The initial term of the use, of the, the initial use of the term capitalism in its modern sense, is attributed to someone else, to Louis Blanc, who in 1850 wrote, uh, wrote it for the very first time and tried to define it, and by Proudhon in 1861. 1861 yeah. Marx and Engels reference also this term to the capitalist system 
and to the capitalist mode of production in the edition of Das Kapital that, uh, that was published in 1867. From here is that we get the most used definition and the main source, source of understanding of what capitalism is as an evil economic system. The use of the word capitalism in reference to an economic system appeared twice in volume one of Das Kapital in the German version in page 124 and in theories of surplus value in the second term while Marx did not exclusively, exclusively use the term capitalism, but he'd rather change it for the capitalist system or on the capitalist mode of production, the term later appeared 2,600 times in the trilogy Das Kapital that was concluded by his, by his friend. In Das Kapital, capitalism is referenced as a system in which, quote, the social wealth becomes in an ever increasing degree the property of those who are in a position to appropriate to themselves again and again the unpaid labor of others. And in the book Theories of Surplus Value, which is a quite interesting book that I had to read, Marx analyzed that the economic processes and relations that regulate social production under capitalism, as the author explains, uh, created, quote, oh no, what they did was, quote, they throw workers together into workplaces in increasing numbers where their labor is collective labor. The work of the laborer employed in applying with a thousand other workers can in no sense be described as private, nor as individual. Capitalist production involves collective cooperative labor, direct social, consciously directed and controlled. The collective and cooperative power of the working class dominated and subsume under the authority of capital. That which is private is not labor in production, but the commodity that is the result of the production process. This is what Marx understood. And this is the system that had been attacked and criticized by many other authors. And it was only, only until Rand said, no, this has to stop. We're doing something right, something bad. It cannot be that a, a system that is created for the sake of profit and for the benefit of the individual is possible of doing something, something as bad as this. I have to understand what happened, and she did it. Generally, the tenor of Marx's argument in his books was rooted by, by, by nature in expropriation. That, this is what he achieved with the theory of capitalist development, and his argument was that while the capitalist is originally structured under a free market system, in which all commodities are allowed uh, to find their own value on the basis of individual entrepreneurial initiative, the immanent tendency that exists in this system is of a capitalist production undermining that all the empirical conditions upon which a capitalist economy was based. In Marx's view, further, the search for profit is intrinsic in capitalism, since, and here's another quote, the aim of capital is not to minister to certain ones, but to produce profit. At the same time, there is rooted in the capitalist economy a structural tendency for the rate of the profit to decline. This was accepted by most of the classical economists from that time, and Marx's contribution, as expressed in his formulation of the law of the falling tendency of the rate of profit, derived from the integration of his theory with the analysis of the organic composition of capital and the relations of the latter to the surplus value. As Marx explained, the total amount of profit in the capitalist economy depended upon the surplus value created within it. And since capitalism was founded upon the competitive search for profit, technological improvement, including above all the increasing mechanization of production, was a major weapon of each capitalist in the viral for survival on the market. You see the, the idea of war as something uh, particular and, and existing in capitalism whereby an individual entrepreneur can increase his share of the available profit by producing at a cheaper rate than his competitors. But his success in obtaining increased profits led other capitalists to follow suit by introducing similar te technical improvements. This is how you, he appreciated uh, competition. Thus producing a new, although equally temporary, equilibrium, where, however, each capitalist had a higher ratio of capital expenditure on constant capital than before. And all of this was achieved on, on the diminishing the, the benefits for the laborers. Hence, 
The overall consequence was a rise in all the organic composition of capital. That's something easy to understand if you follow Marx. And what happened as an end result was that there was a fall in the average profit, rate of profit. And we were becoming poorer. You see it everywhere. Like they will say, no, we are getting power, we are getting poorer, poorer, poorer. All capitalists are creating profit and distributing it for themselves, etc., etc. In his understanding of how capitalism worked, Marx also laid most stress upon the countervailing forces of the falling rate of the profit. And other things being equal uh, with the lengthening of the working day, which was a definite empirical phenomenon during the early years in the 19th century, as you see the development of the industrial revolution, especially in, in the UK, raised all the rate of surplus value. In Marx's in Marx perspective further, the productivity of labor relative to constant capital was also something that is easy to augment. And the rate of surplus value increased through making more intensive use of existing machinery by, for example, uh, spending up the operation of them or by utilize, utilizing it for 24 hours, 24 hours a day uh, was a very good system that came to be what we now call sweatshops. Added to this explanation that Marx gave on how technological improvements allow for the competitive search for profit, he also elaborated on how capitalist societies were to exist in a legal framework on commerce and on a physical infrastructure provided by the state. This legal, fr legal framework was created to secure the protection of the capitalist, of, of the capitalist, of his property, and in all of it was done in the detriment of the interests of the proletarians. The physical infrastructure, while of use of the, for the proletarians, because they also benefited from it, was not created for them, but for the benefit of the interests of profit-seeking elites. After Marx died, Engels' revisions and more extensive use of the term capitalism became, became widespread. And in volumes two and three of Das Kapital, he emphasized the irreconcilable class relations that existed in the capitalist system and that were to end in the accumulation of wealth at one pole and of poverty and misery at the other. This previous set of ideas, which is very extensive and loaded, continued to be st studied in similar ways uh, and questioned by schools that follow through uh, Marxism until today. And a great example that maybe will be easy for here will be something that happened 100 years, uh, from the first 100 years of the American history and which many classical liberal authors have paid lots of attention and to, with whom I kind of I disregard a lot. And I refer to the anti-concept of how corporatism developed since the foundation of the United States of America and which culminated in the first stage, stage uh, with the demonization of the robber barons in late 19th, 19th century. The robber barons, that's the so-called political entrepreneurs, were not capitalists but corporatists or to use a term that Adam Smith employed in The Wealth of Nations, were mercantilists because of their close relations to government privileges. These political entrepreneurs gain an unfair advantage to special privileges. There, uh, Thomas Di Lorenzo makes a very interesting argument defending them, I disagree. And I consider that they did gain a special privilege created by government intervention in the way of direct subsidies, and regulations that harm their competitors, among others. And Di Lorenzo makes an argument, yes, they had, uh, you can argue that they have uh, privileges, etc., etc., but at the end of the day, even if they had a, a big part of the market, it was not granted by government. They did it by themselves, and prices were lower. I'm not sure about it. Yes, they innovated and created thousands of jobs in, in the U.S. and Europe, but they were by no means a young gold who innovated and created wealth with the beautiful ode that all the members that joined in Gold's College had to say that, I, ask, I swear by my life and by my love of it that I will never live for the sake of others nor ask any other man to live for the sake of mine. And this is what a real entrepreneur is supposed to do. This is what a capitalist does in a system that is consistent. Also, Smith wrote uh, about the mercantilist system and uh, 160 years year later many of his ideas were already being denied as, as also facts. 
In the restraints upon imports that were used to be given for the benefit of mercantilism of foreign commodities in Africa and Asia, uh, was embedded this uh, term as something very important that had to be understood. Of course, the United States, when was created, uh, was never created without a direct link to mercantilism and how it worked. And slavery continued in the country since it was founded, so there was no morality here. Uh, there were many conversations that Ben Franklin had with many French uh, scholars during that time. And he said, yes, I understand this is something important. We had to solve this, but maybe in the next couple of years, we'll be able of figuring out how, what to do with the slavery as a system that is against the, the very de principles of the Declaration. Someone who did a lot of damage to the potentiality of capitalism to emerge was Alexander Hamilton and his followers, who were the first ones to push for special privileges from government, as they advocated for a more centralized type of government that will plan the economy, primarily for the benefit of the business interests. They were also businessmen. They were not moral by any means. They advocated tariffs to protect American businesses from foreign competition. They asked for tax-funded subsidies for certain businesses. And they were up for a central bank that could print money uh, to pay for these schemes. Then later, from the 30s and 50s in America, the special businesses interested who advocated bringing the corrupt European mercantilist system back were supported by the Whig Party, Whig Party and they, they were backed by the Republican Party. They finally prevailed when, during the war between the states. And as you may know, all these policies were finally put into place. It was finally materialized when Abraham Lincoln managed to get in power. And all these interventions took many forms. The most common form of intervention in, in, in go by the government has been since then price and wage controls. And these measures have always been instituted for political reasons that almost inevitably created problems greater than the ones they were supposed to fix. So now how, how is it that the Constitution that had such a strong values ended up being captured by mercantilists? First, the separation of powers was weak since it was founded in a contradictory and irrational moral philosophy. Let us remember that the principles of altruism and collectivism were widely accepted and advocated also by many of the founding fathers. They were not saints who wanted to be independent from British control only. They created to keep and protect the systems from being controlled by this. They tried to keep the system from being controlled by special privileges groups. And they did so in the 10th Amendment with the dual sovereignty title. And under the system, the central government was given certain powers to check on the tyrannical proclivities of the states and from foreigners. Unfortunately, this couldn't be balanced, and it allowed for the capture of government but by, the anti by the Federalist movement. There was a rebellion, as you know, after the, the War of the States, and it had to be put down by a federal army. Uh, the same happened in 1914, after the Great War, the growth of government doubled in just five, six years. And that's something that you will see in, uh, in government expansion in the modern state type of organization. It's very easy to make the economy grow as much as one wants in a couple of years only with either an internal or foreign menace. As I try to do in this short overview of what the term capitalism is and where it came from, how Marx, the, found, like the creator of the term, understood it. The term capitalism was created to represent a malicious system and to be destroyed. The aim for any socialist was to destroy the system. Rightfully, the system that many socialists and correct, um, collectivists attacked by the name of capitalism was not based on objectivity nor on valid principles of a society that was going to be just. The systems that actually collectivists called capitalists was a system that left opportunity and legal loopholes for the development of tyranny. That's something that we are now having to struggle with. And I think that if there's a lesson that we can take now from the 18th and 19th centuries is that there existed not a clear definition of what the right of the pursuit of happiness means. And this is something very important in order to understand how a capitalist will work and pursue happiness and make profits, etc., etc., and organize in a, in a government. 
because the idea that man has a right to live for himself and to choose what constituted his own private, personal and individual happiness and of to working for his achievement was never based upon an objective and non-contradictory code of values. An individual's pursuit of happiness required for him to respect the same rights to others. It meant that man could not be forced to devote uh, his life and his pursuit of happiness in other men and it also meant that the collective couldn't decide for him what were going to be his utilitarian valorizations. Hundreds of events can be pulled upon uh, to study now from the 19th century that I think clearly demonstrate that the code of values that guided the great majority of men's choices and actions did not consider man's life as a standard of their decisions. And as such, by the beginning of the 20th century, many of the principles of a system based upon the recognition of individual rights in which all property was privately owned were already just historical memory for many. As sad and fu or funny as it may seem, I think that it were collectivists at the beginning of the century who by, the, by then had already won the battle in explaining how a free economy without a, without a rule of law and objectivist ethics ended up, ended up granting privileges for groups of interests and of how utilitarian classical liberalism failed to explain why capitalism was the best social system. It took almost 60 years more until Ms. Rand rediscovered the term and rescue it. So tomorrow I will try to explore what has occurred during the last hundred years uh, in history and in the discourses on, in regard to capitalism and also I will try to explore Ms. Rand's heroic writings that gave us an instrument to start a capitalist moral revolution for the first time in history. Thank you. You disagree with uh, Di Lorenzo. Excuse me? You disagree with Di Lorenzo. Yes. Uh -huh. You think that the robber barons did things wrong or yeah. took government favors. Correct. He says they didn't take government favors. Vanderbilt was caught bribing a government official, I believe, mm -hmm. at one point. And the reason he did that is because he couldn't get his railroad started or he couldn't get in business because the government was blocking him from doing anything that he wanted to do. Is that the same way, my question is I guess, since the robber barons couldn't do what they wanted to do because government blocked them, is that the reason that you, don't, you disagree with Di Lorenzo or why do you disagree with Di Lorenzo? I don't think that will be the point because it will be the same as the government blocked them is the same way the government is blocking us right now by taxing us and taking that money from us, right? The, yes, the government had many blocks for the development of these big industries of oil, rails, etc., etc. But the point was that they were actually collaborating with the government in order to keep specific areas of control for them. So, for example, in the history of the development of the rails in, in the U.S., they had already fought and lobbied for, for grants in specific areas of the territory that they could develop. Didn't they all go out of business and didn't the ones that stayed in business, uh, the only ones that stayed, the railroad stayed in business, are the ones that didn't get granted government favors. The ones that did get granted government favors went out of business. That's part of his argument too, but that's not true. There were many of the people who continued and came out, you know, the point is if, if, your, if your premises are wrong, then the, the, if you start with some favors in one thing, but then you say, the rest of the things they did was okay. At the end, what you have is a mixed system. So they are not an example of someone who actually worked and created these great things in America. Like the building in front of us was donated by, by, by Carnegie, I think. So they did many, well, many good things, but at the same, they profited from the system. So I, th I don't see how they could cons be considered like heroes as anyone who entered jungle, like Galskolch, would have done so. So Rockefeller is not a hero either, or? Sorry? Rockefeller is also not a hero. I think he has many values and he did a lot of things, but I will not consider him as a capitalist uh, to whom we should uh, go back in history and point out, hey, look, Rockefeller is what a capitalist is ought to be. Yes, he was an entrepreneur, but 
if you understand the context in which this was developed, or the labor especially, especially that was used to build all the things that he had, uh, was already, you, you can see there, there were controls of government that favored him. Okay. And he profited from, from it. This is, a, I guess, a similar, uh, oh, first of all, excellent talk. Um, uh, I guess maybe this is maybe a different way to understand the question that uh, was just put forward, that in my, is your essential point more that the system that existed in the late 19th century was not capitalism, and that you have to make a distinction between what capitalism is as a as a as a system as a as a as a as a normative as a set of normative ideals as opposed to reality what really happens so it might be that we might have a positive uh, regard for some of these people you can maybe debate about which ones that maybe they did the best they could given the system they were in uh, maybe they were virtuous people but uh, they weren't capitalists in the, I guess, in the sense that they were operating within a capitalist system. Is that what you're trying to say? Exactly, yeah. Okay, so, so, it's, so you're not saying that these are like bad people or oh, anything? Oh, no, no. Yeah. The, the thing is that, as Ms. Rand said, and she made it very clear, like capitalism has not existed never in history. So by us granting them the title of capitalist in, the, in, her, in her sense in which they had to be- In the philosophical be, sense. In the philosophical yeah. sense, of course. But we have to do his, his, like historiography. If, if I want to do historiography on theory, based on theory and objectivist theory in history, I need to be consistent on some of those terms. So by doing this, I am opening the doors for someone to easily attack me because I'm using it. If I'm not using it consistently with my philosophy, then I'm playing with their terms. And the, the chances that they will win an argument will, will be almost on their side. So instead of talking about them as capitalists, who are, who are heroes that we should admire and try to live by their, by their work, et cetera, et cetera, it's better to say they were businessmen who were in the industrialists, et cetera, et cetera, which are uh, definitions and concepts that are not loaded with Marxist attacks. Going back to the uh, robber baron's comment, uh, so to speak, what do you think about uh, someone I would consider a capitalist today, Elon Musk, SpaceX, Tesla, one of the most amazing uh, car companies um, around today that I think are gonna, is going to propel the electric vehicle uh, forward into the future is something that's actually a sustainable idea um, in context with what Ludwig von Mises said, that don't hate the capitalist for his means, hate that those means exist, mm -hmm. right? Elon Musk was able to get investment from Chrysler is that necessarily a bad move on Elon Musk's part? Because without that, he made a strategic move that was the right business choice, and it was the in, in the interest of creating wealth. I understand that Chrysler giving him the money that was effectually bailout money, that's bad. But is Elon Musk any less of a capitalist for taking that move? Because I, I honestly believe, unless you could persuade me otherwise, that that was a capitalist move to bring Tesla to profitability. Well, I think that was an efficiency move more than a capitalist move. So if we try to stick with the term and what it should uh, mean. So yes, he was very, he took the, the most utility-based decision then to go for the money with, with Chrysler. But if he knew that he was actually taking the money that was not his, this reminds me to Ragnar's. Um, and it's a very good point that Rand made in the book, like you will not use the money of others. Like Ragnar will all the time give back the money that was actually the product and result of entrepreneurial activity of innovation. But he never gave back to, to Dagny uh, the money that was created by the, by the benefit of the government. Do you remember that part? I, I, absolutely, and I guess my point is that that money he did not take from someone else. Had Elon not taken that money, Chrysler would have produced a bunch of more crap cars. But, <laughs> right? But, yeah. but instead, uh -huh. he created wealth with that money. So maybe it's not the perfect solution, but is that not better that he did that and took that money and created wealth with it as opposed to it stagnating in Chrysler? Yeah, it was, I think, the most efficient solution. Was efficient? It was not the perfect solution. It was surely not the ethical solution because if you, it's like having a full box of white balls of sugar. If you put one black dot of well, like black sugar, that, that's no longer going to be white sugar. You mean like, 
once you put dirty money with good money and then you mix it, it will be very hard to track which are uh, uh, the, which is the money going to be going to and allocated, and you can no longer you can no, no longer say that you are a, an ethical man. Okay, so it, that you would then advocate if someone had the opportunity to advance and create wealth via a move that uh, like Elon Musk made, that the true capitalist has to say no in that situation. I will consider so, in order for the, for the sake of consistency and no contradiction. Yes. Thank you. Um, You make a good point that a pure capitalism has never existed. And so when you look back on some particular period, you cannot take problems that happened then and attribute them to capitalism. And that's a mm -hmm. well established, I think that's fair. On the other hand, objectivism's case for capitalism is an empirical case based on a history that in general that, that held, sort of proves that entrepreneurship is good, that greater freedom leads to greater prosperity. Mm -hmm. And so if you disregard those aspects of history because they weren't perfect capitalism and, and say those people didn't act well because they weren't perfect capitalists, then you lose the entire objectivist case for capitalism to begin with. So how do we square the fact that we, I mean, the fact that it wasn't perfect capitalism with the fact that we that we can't completely disregard all of history. I, I think I get your point, but the thing is that you have to call a term for what it's mean, for what it means. So, and I don't think that if we approach that, all these processes that are taking us to a more capitalist society, we call them as capitalistic. We are, ex we are talking of this system can exist by parts. And that's not the way Ayn Rand pre presented, and that's not the way you will objectively achieve it. So you can talk, I think it's, it will be say, it's okay to say like, as we have seen entrepreneurial activity and freedom from government intervention has worked, so as therefore we can say that freedom works in, or government, uh, government limitations are, and restrictions to a specific area, maybe objectivists like uh, the idea of minarchism, in which the government only controls the specific areas in which security is given, but you have to call the thing, the terms by its own right name. So I wouldn't call it capitalist. Instead, why not saying it like free market or laissez-faire? The more laissez-faire you have, the more, a cap the more we are approaching for a capitalist society. Of course, then you have to understand that laissez-faire is not like, like windfall reactions and decisions that are taken without the government controlling you, but that are rational and objective and etc. etc. So this is why we have to understand capitalism by the axioms that Ayn Rand already developed. That will be my point of differentiation, I think. Uh, I think you've fallen into some uh, Marxian trap by trying to equate capitalism and capitalists in the way Marx meant. Uh, description, you, you gave a good description of what capitalism is. It's a system of government or run for the with private property and so on. But uh, the term capitalist you've used from Marx and Engels and so on. Just like an objectivist is one who supports objectivism, a capitalist would be one who supports capitalism and it would be the lowest wage earner in capitalism, if he stands for that, he's a capitalist. The owner of capital should stop, be, we should stop using the name capitalist for the owner of capital, especially for those who own a lot of capital. They are not capitalists, not necessarily, and not by definition, that's what not what defines them. I mean, they are, they are owners of capital, big or small. Um, I think the distinction should be kept very clear because falling into the trap, somebody would uh, immediately say, capitalism is a system where capitalists prevail and, uh, and that's how they call it. That's why they call it uh, 
big capitalism or crony capitalism because that's how they define capitalists. So, uh, I think I've never said that. So, if you like, we could read all over again my presentation or go watch and see it again in the live stream if someone taped it anywhere online. I've never said that. So I did mention how capitalism was defined by whom and how it developed as a term, capitalist. What capitalism came to be afterwards by people who follow, follow suit this definition and how they understood it. But I did say that capitalism was a system completely different from what the definition they gave and that capitalists, the people who are part of it, all of us, if we were in a capitalist system right now here in this room, will be correctly to be called capitalist. So I'm not against using the term when it's right to use it. Au contraire, no. Given the history you mentioned both of the term and of economies, uh, do you think perhaps we should reconsider Rand's judgment that the word capitalism should be rescued and defined in terms of those principles uh, and perhaps actually use terms like laissez-faire and free market uh, that are less ambiguous and don't also don't have that confusion about whether a capitalist means a person who supports capitalism or a person who owns a lot of capital and deploys it in certain ways. Well, I think that we should first try to do, especially in the field of history, we need a theory. A new theory that there is non-existent. If you check any other books, like the trends that we have in history are completely outdated, completely contradictory, and we still continue reading all the books in which they talk about gender, class struggle, developed world, against less developed worlds, etc., etc. So I, d I do think that we need to rediscover the term capitalism by why it really stands, try to reapply it, but first we need to create a theory for the study of history, which is my field, and we can be consistently using it without failing to the, to the terms themselves. I don't know if that answered. I'm going to exert moderator privilege and ask a question. <laughs> Your uh, reading of all of the 19th century anti-capitalist thinkers, and you uh, make the case that capitalism was originally a pejorative term, uh, I guess my question is where does their anti-capitalism come from? Is it that yeah, first and foremost, they're trying to do economics, but it's the early days of economics. And so they kind of mess up or misinterpret what this new economic system is all about. And based on that misinterpretation, they have moral outrage. And so they become anti-capitalists that way. Or is it that really the, the moral objection from their perspective comes first? That they just, they know what the system is about, but they're morally outraged by it and that's what's really driving their anti-capitalism. So is it mistaken economics, or is it moral disagreement, first and foremost, that's driving the anti-capitalist 19th century thinkers? I would think that it's first an ethical issue, and it was because of the ethical code of the people during that time in which they considered the capitalist profit versus the people who were working for them uh, who were condemned because they were making lots of profit and that's I tried to approach it of how they were making lots of property and they consider it to be a static wealth so the laborers were just losing their pro like their workforce and they were sacrificing themselves for the benefit of someone else without they could keep paying back which was highly criticized and obviously this all the readings that we have from history during that times were done by either intellectuals or people in power who were at the same time feeling guilty about themselves. Like the people who moved from the towns to work for industries and cities were not, I not, don't think that they felt that they were going to be like sacrificial animals for the, for the men in the, leading the industry because they knew that either they went for the factory and worked like it is happening right now in India or Central America. Like they either go and work for an industry and for a factory and get the money to feed their children or they will have starved to death eating the same corn that they so difficultly were able of, of planting in their, in their backyards, which were very bad. So, so I think it's more an ethical thing and not an economic point. Mm -hmm. All right. 
3.30 will end exactly on time. Thank you. I guess I don't ask my question.